Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, third round of virtual training on the SDG Indicator 241. My name is uh, Stefania Bacci. I am Italian and I am a statistician working in the statistics division of FAO headquarters since 2008. I immediately give the floor to Aspandiar for the official welcome address. And they are to you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefania. So good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Statistics Division of FAO on this uh, first day of the virtual training on SD241 amid the coronavirus pandemic. This is uh, the third in the series of the three virtual trainings of which we have uh, organized two successfully in September for selected countries from Asian and Latin American and Caribbean region. My name is Arbab Asfandiar Khan and I work as an economist with Statistics Division of FAO at its headquarters in Rome and will be your leading resource person for the, this, this three days uh, virtual training. For this training, I'm joined by my colleague, Stefania Bachi, who already introduced herself she is the one behind making all the organizational arrangements for this training and will be playing a key role of facilitator during the course of the next three days. For this training, we are expected to be joined by around 80 esteemed officials from 10 countries belonging to Africa, Near East, Europe, Central Asia, and these countries include Armenia, Belarus, Burkina Faso, Malawi, Mali, Oman, Russian Federation, Uganda, Ukraine, and United Arab Emirates. Let me highlight that we have already collaborated with several of these countries at various stages of the methodological development of SDG 241, especially Russian Federation that contributed to the indicator's methodology and its different aspects. And Oman that got trend on the indicator methodology last year. Uh, we will have a good mix of participants with diverse backgrounds, including representatives from national statistical offices, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, and other institutions and organizations relevant to sustainability issues. Um, we are also joined by FAO colleagues from, from the headquarters here in Rome and different regions, sub-regional and country offices. We hope that this virtual training will be a great opportunity for all of you to enhance your understanding about the fundamental building blocks of SDG 241 and its policy use when it gets implemented. The training will be interactive as we gradually in a phased manner will cover the different aspects of the indicator. That is its conceptual and methodological basis, scope and coverage, the data collection and analysis tools, and processes and mechanisms for reporting it back to FAO. As we move along, we will take breaks for questions and discussion and try to answer the questions that you may have. We would like to extend thanks to Mr. Georgi, the Regional Statistician for Europe and Central Asia, and Ms. Katerina, Assistant Liaison Officer for Russian Federation of FAO. Mr. Paul, the Regional Statistician for Africa, Ms. Nancy uh, Chin, the Regional Statistician for Near East and North Africa. We are also joined by other colleagues uh, from FAO Regional Country Staff, and we are very thankful for their contribution in supporting us with the organizational aspects of this training, especially in making the last minute arrangements for Russian translation, which we really appreciate. Most importantly, we would like to express our gratitude and profound appreciation to the country institution and organizations for supporting this training and their nominated representatives and officials who have made room in their busy schedule to attend this training in these extraordinary circumstances. We are expecting to have an active participation and constructive discussion throughout this training. Thank you very much once again. With this brief introduction, I will now leave the floor again to Stefania. Okay, thank you, Aspandiar. Thank you for this introductory speech. Uh, let me uh, share with you my screen now. Uh, share, okay. Can you, can you see my screen? It's okay. 
Yes, yes, okay. we can see it. Okay, sorry, I had some strange messages. <laughs> That's why I was doubting. Okay, so, okay, now it is. Uh, let me give you immediately some quick uh, few instructions. Uh, actually, they were already listed in the concept notes, but uh, it's important now to highlight again a few. Uh, preferably use a PC or a laptop and not a mobile phone or a tablet. This is because the content sometimes could be heavy to follow, so it's important to have this screen and also that you are comfortable in a silent place with no background noise, please, or echo, and that you have a clear vision of your monitor. Uh, a suggestion, please turn off all the sound sub notifications, uh, Skype, WhatsApp, emails, uh, and whatever. If you have connectivity issues, so if our voice breaks or the, the video freeze, Close uh, the other application that you might have opened on your computer. If it doesn't work, also maybe you can check through your house or your office, wherever you are, if you can switch off some devices. You can access the Zoom from all devices, both via web browser or via the application. But the download of the application is strongly recommended. Uh, both for a better user experience, of course, but also because uh, the simultaneous translation is only available through the application, so not via the browser. Please consider that also Zoom regularly provides a new version of the application, so it's strongly recommended that you check that your Zoom ap application is updated so that you know that all the new features uh, works on your uh, application and also to enhance the security uh, of it. To do so, it's very quick, very easy. You just open the application and click on your profile picture that is in the top right of the Zoom window and then uh, you check for update. If there is a new version, Zoom will download and install it. Um, here. It's uh, displayed, sorry. Uh, for a better sound quality, please uh, do not use our built-in computer microphone, but it's preferable to use a USB headset with an integrated microphone or a wired earphone microphone, but not Bluetooth. I mean, this is a suggestion, of course. If uh, several participants use one unique microphone, please make sure that who is speaking is close to the microphone. For future use, uh, sessions will be recorded and uploaded on the SDG webpage, probably. So in case you don't want to show your face, please keep your camera off even when you are talking. Let's go now through a few rules. First of all, please follow the meeting the mute mode and click unmute uh, only when you are speaking or when you are giving the floor. This is because today we are almost 100 participants uh, and often it can happen that we have noises in the background that disturbs the trainers. So we kindly ask also uh, to have the camera switched off for not overloading the internet bandwidth. You can switch on the camera when uh, you're speaking. The two icons are quite intuitive and on the bottom left uh, of the Zoom interface. If you have a question, write in the chat box that you have one and wait for the SDG 241 team to give you the floor. You unmute yourself, you, uh, if you want, you have the video turned off, turned on, sorry, and uh, unless of, a co of course you don't want to, uh, but please be ready to turn it off in case of poor connection. You speak loud and close to the microphone, please, and state your name and your question. And when you finish, you mute yourself back and you switch off the camera. You can also raise uh, the hand virtually for a request in the floor. You just need to look for this symbol. Uh, it is, of course, the hand raise function and it is in the participants menu, so you can find it in the participants menu. 
The floor will be passed to participants based on the order that appears on my screen, uh, of course, to the extent possible. Mm. And if many questions are asked, uh, don't worry, we will answer all of that, all of them, but we will consolidate, consolidate them by subjects. Uh, and still, if there will be too many, maybe we will answer the following day. But please be ensured that we'll reply all of them. Please ensure that your name uh, and the country names appear in the name box. To do this, you just click on the dots appearing in the right hand corner of your image box. You select rename and you insert your country name and last name. Please, this is very important for us because uh, when we receive the questions, we know immediately which country are you from. From time to time, we will be asking questions as a sort of quizzes through the poll function in Zoom. Uh, so please don't hesitate to ask clarification if something is not clear, since you will be asked to reply to all questions. Finally, whatever issues you have, please write me. You can use the private chat. You just need to change it easily in the general chat. You just need to, to change this, the recipient's name. I will be happy to help you for any kind of doubts, question, or technical matters you might have. So as you know, interpretation is available in Russian and can be selected through, uh, in the bottom bar. You, if you prefer to follow the training in Russian, you switch on to the Russian channel by clicking here, as it is displayed. You will hear the, your translation at 80% volume with the original speaker at 20%. So you can still hear tone and intonation for greater understanding, of course. Please be in mind that it, uh, in a virtual meeting, audio quality may de de deteriorate unexpectedly and become insufficient for interpretation purpose. So our interpreters will indicate this verbally and resume interpretation as soon as the sound quality permits. We have uh, Mrs. Ksenia Panevkina and Mr. Egor Kokriashinkin. Sorry for the presentation. Uh, they are our two interpreters today. You can see the word interpreter close to their names. Please pay attention to the icons. So if you see the flags indicating the languages, this is just an image, so it's displayed in Spanish, but this is just for you to understand, uh, I mean, this uh, uh, picture here on the left. So if you see the flags, it means that your Zoom application is not updated. So in that case, please update it before uh, uh, going forward. Uh, you need to see instead the initials of the languages. And it is displayed here. You see Ru, Ru, which is the Russian. So, uh, yeah, sorry. So that's all for now. I hope everything was clear. In case not, you know, I am available through the chat. And uh, now uh, let's start uh, uh, the training. Let me stop the sharing. I switch on my video so you can see me again. Okay, so let's start the training. The agenda for today is quite concentrated. We are going to learn about some of the SDG indicators, and of course, we will concentrate on the, two, the SDG 241. Specifically, we will see all the 11 sub indicators that compose the three dimensions the economic, the environmental, and the social dimensions. Today we should pay big attention to all that Aspandiar will be explaining because it's the fundamental part of the whole training. So let's start immediately. The first session introduced the 21 SDG indicators that are under FAO custodial sheet. So Aspandiar, you have the floor. Stefania, can you please confirm yes. if you can see my presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, so let's begin. So before we dive deep into the methodology of SDG 241 and start disentangling its complexities step by step, 
In this very first presentation, I will give you an overview of the SDG indicators under FAO custodianship, with focus obviously on the progress that we have made until so far, both on the methodological and capacity development fronts. During the course of the presentation, I will also introduce to you our future plans for capacity development, that is technical assistance and trainings, and support to country data collection and reporting efforts to facilitate national, regional, and global monitoring of FAO SDG indicators. Briefly, we will cover the following key points in this presentation, the 21 FAO SDG indicators and its current TF status, our work on SDG indicators so far on various fronts, that is methodological capacity development and support to data collection and reporting. Um, the overview of our potential future lines of work in support of maximizing data reporting on SDGs. And lastly, the presentation will illustrate important resources that we have developed, that is e-learning courses and website links, et cetera, where you will find additional and detailed information on FAO SDGs. So let me begin by giving you an overarching and holistic overview of the global indicator framework and the process that was adopted by United Nations for its, for its implementation and opera, operationalizations at the national, regional, and global levels. The global indicator framework comprises of 231 unique indicators, and it was endorsed by the United Nations General Assembly in July 2017. So in order to carry forward or see and manage this process, the United Nations Statistical Commission was made responsible for development and impl implementation of SDG monitoring framework. And in addition, an interagency and expert group on sustainable development uh, goal indicators, that is IAEG SDG, was constituted to prepare initial proposals on the methodology and to oversee this work until 2030. The IAEG SDG has 28 countries as members, which represent their respective regions. An important point to note is that the process with IAEG SDG has been fully led um, and owned by countries with international organization only serving as observers. So based on the level of methodological development and the availability of data on the respective uh, SDG indicators, the IAEG SDG has divided the indicators into three tiers. Tier one uh, being indicators which are conceptually clear and, and, and internationally established methodology and standards are available and that data are regularly produced by more than 50% of the countries and of the population in every region where the indicator is relevant. Tier two being the indicators that are clear and methodology and standards are available, but data are not regularly produced by countries or is produced by less than 50% of the countries or population in each region. And tier three are those indicators for which an internationally established methodology or standards does not yet exist, but, uh, but methodology are, and standards are being or will be developed or tested. As of 51, 51st session of the United Nations Statistical Commission, the global indicator framework does not contain any tier three indicators. So all of the indicators have already been uh, reclassified either as tier two or, uh, or tier one. So in order to support the methodological development and monitoring process for each SDG indicator, a custodian UN agency was identified and was assigned the following responsibilities. First, to lead the methodological development and documentation of the indicators. Secondly, to support statistical capacity of countries to generate and disseminate national data. Thirdly, to collect data from national sources ensure its com comparability and consistency and disseminate it at the global level. And lastly, to contribute to monitoring the progress at the global, regional, and national levels. Uh, for example, uh, to uh, uh, develop storylines and data for annual SDG reports and agency flagship uh, 
publications. Now, the global indicators are a core set of matrices that all countries are invited to monitor and report to custodian UN agencies. The key point to remember is that if national data are not produced, uh, regional and global indicators cannot be uh, produced. Another important point to be noted is that global indicators can be complemented, and this is very important, uh, but not replaced with national or regional indicators. This is as per paragraph 75 of the United Nations resolution on, uh, on the 2030 agenda. The is based on data produced by countries with national statistical offices having a key coordinating role at the national level for international reporting. So even if the estimates for some indicators are produced by the international organizations, prior consultation, triangulation, and validation is needed or required with countries before it is published by the custodian agency. Um, SPO, our custodian UN agency for 21 SDG indicators and a contributing agency for five others, primarily related to food and agriculture space. In this capacity, FAO is supporting country efforts in monitoring the 2030 agenda. The 21 SDG indicators are spread across six goals that include goal two, which is on food security, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture, goal five on gender equity, goal six on use of water, goal 12 on sustainable consumption and production, goal 14 on oceans, and goal 15 on life on, uh, on land. So FAO as a custodian UN agency for 21 SDG indicators, uh, we are responsible for statistical capacity development, global data collection and its dissemination, global progress reports and a voluntary review submitted by the countries to FAO and communication and advocacy around the 21 SDG indicators. In terms of FAO work on SDG indicators, back in 2015, of the 21 SDG indicators, 13 were tier three indicators. This means that FAO had to develop new methodological proposals in consultation with countries and compile it with IAEG SDG criteria for tier three reclassification. This was the case for indicators 2.3.1, 2.3.2, 2.4.1, 2.3.1, 1, and so on. For some SDG indicators, FAO also had to develop new international definitions for key concepts. For example, definition of small scale food producers in case of SDG indicator 2.3.1 and 2.3.2 and a definition of rural urban areas, which is used for disaggregation of many SDGs, um, uh, even though FAO. The work, of Sonia? course, uh, didn't stop at the methodological development stage. Sorry? Sonia, sorry to interrupt you. Is it possible to use the headset because the translators uh, uh, would prefer if you can use the headset. Okay, just hold on for one second. Thank you. We can't hear you. I don't know if you are talking. Uh, 
Uh, hello, Stefania, can you hear me now? Yes, now, yes. Is, is thank it better? You, thank you. Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry for that. No, don't worry. So I was telling you that the work didn't stop at the methodological development stage, but continued at a fast pace, where in addition to methodological development for all indicators under our custodianship, we developed improved data collection tools, guidelines, and supporting material to facilitate country reporting on the, on the newly developed methodologies um, uh, and, and to improve it and endorse it uh, with IAEG SDG. This slide summarizes the tier status of indicators with red being tier three, yellow being tier two, and green tier one. Now, as of November 2015, 13 indicators back then were tier three, five were tier two, and only three were tier one. This meant a lot of our work was focused on methodological development of the indicators back in 2015. Um, hence, given the intensity of the work involved, we as FAO realigned our work programs, both strategically and operationally to support the methodological development of the tier three indicator. With the four years of teams responsible for respective SDGs that FAO had co -authored while leveraging a participatory, consultative, and inclusive process, and most importantly, um, with the support from officials and experts from countries, international organizations, private sector, and academia, we were able to establish methodological basis for all the remaining tier three indicators. As you may see in the matrix, currently none of the indicator remains as tier three. In parallel with the methodological development, uh, lots of our efforts were targeted to support countries to enable them start adopting, Im implementing, and reporting data on the 21 SDG indicators under our custodianship. This included testing the organization of its methodologies, development of e-learning courses, organization of country, regional, and global uh, training workshops, to build the statistical capacity of the countries and development of a comprehensive SDG data and communication portal that serve as a one-stop shop for all information on SDG indicators. Our new vision uh, for 2019 to 2030, of course, is to scale up capacity um, and our efforts to support to maximize uh, country reporting. The aim of uh, these training workshops, including this very virtual training this is, that is progressing now, uh, has been to invite countries to collaborate on testing of the new methods that were developed, enlarge the pool of SDG monitoring experts at the country level, facilitate South-South cooperation uh, amongst the countries. So, so we have 50 plus training workshops between 2017 and 2020 that were participated by experts from 150 plus countries belonging to all regions of the world. The ultimate focus was obviously to increase the number of data points, that is the number of uh, reporting countries. In order to facilitate countries in developing their understanding of the SDG indicators, we have also prepared e-learning courses for almost all the 21 SDG indicators that have now been published and available freely online on FAO dedicated SDG portal. These are excellent resources that will help you get acquainted with the indicator methodology, data collection and reporting at your own convenience. Here are some of the e-learning courses that have been uploaded. And some more courses that that were uh, that, that are already available on our uh, FAO SDG portal. We are currently in process of finalizing the e-learning course on 1471, 
which is uh, uh, an SDG indicator related to value added for sustainable fish fisheries. One of the key feature of these e-learning courses is that uh, we have uh, added recently a feature that upon successful completion of the e-learning course, the, um, you will be awarded uh, a course completion uh, certificate. All of the information on these e-learning courses can be accessed uh, by clicking uh, this link here. Going forward, at FAO, we will continue to work closely and collaborate with our member states to pursue and implement our future activities, particularly those focused on capacity development, um, which includes first um, uh, further work on various methodological aspects of the indicators and its testing, that is uh, data disaggregation techniques, forecasting, now casting, and small area estimation to facilitate reporting on the 21 SDG indicators under our custodianship. The second is uh, in collaboration with our member states to carry out data gap assessments at the national level. The third one is to further strengthen our engagement with national stakeholders, particularly, particularly on the alignment of national and regional indicator frameworks with the SDGs, which we believe uh, in doing so will reduce uh, data collection and reporting burden on the countries that already face resource constraints. Another key area of work would be to provide support in further development and implementation of new data collection tools including alternative data sources and new means of data collection uh, like cell phones and computer assisted uh, web interviews, especially amid corona uh, virus uh, pandemic that has uh, slowed down if not stalled the face-to-face -face data collection due to travel restrictions. We will continue to provide capacity development through various modalities, including through uh, virtual trainings to support countries in the adoption, implementation, and reporting of the FAO SDG indicators. And lastly, to provide uh, technical assistance in improving the analysis and use of FAO SDG indicators in making uh, informed uh, decisions and the practical policies uh, at, at the national level. With this, uh, I will close this presentation. Um, for general information on SDGs, please don't hesitate to write to the Office of the Chief Statistician uh, that coordinate the SDG work of FAO at the global, regional, and national level using the first uh, email address. For matters related to SDG 241, you can reach out to us using the dedicated email address SDG241-indicator at FAO.org. Thank you very much. Stefania, the floor is yours. Yes. Sorry. Okay, here I am. Okay. Thank you, Spandayar, for this uh, introductory uh, presentation to the SDG under the FAO world. Uh, so, as he said, we have 21 SDG indicators in FAO, but you know that in this training, we are focusing only on one, the two for one. So, proportion of agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture. So, uh, Spandian, you have again the floor for introducing to all the participants to this uh, indicator. We don't have any questions until not, so far, right? Not okay. yet. Okay, perfect. So, uh, before I, you know, so the, the, as Stefania mentioned, the focus of our training uh, today is on SEG indicator 2.4.1, which is defined as proportion of agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture. The core objective of this uh, three day training are to first and foremost, I will walk you through the SEG 241 conceptual and methodological basis is compilation and interpretation. We will cover this part predominantly today. Um, tomorrow, uh, we will focus on the tools and instrument developed for collecting and reporting data on the indicator. Uh, you will get to know about the survey questionnaire and related documents. Um, SDG 241 in context of 
Agri Survey and 50 by 2030 initiative, and also the FAO data collection questionnaire, which is uh, an instrument developed by FAO to collect data from, from the member countries. On the third day, uh, we will uh, discuss with you the data gaps and uh, your concrete plans in the short, medium, and long term to collect uh, data on the indicator in order to bridge those gaps and then finally report it to FAO. And lastly, and our all aim of this training is also to unite and uh, or assemble key stakeholders at the country level. Um, those who are responsible for collecting and reporting that data, that is representatives from the National Statistical Office, but also those responsible for using uh, this data uh, for evidence-based policies at the national or subnational level, that is the representatives from the Ministry of Agriculture and other relevant institutions. So to contextualize, as highlighted in the previous presentation at FAO, we develop global public goods, that is methodology, standards, and classification uh, systems in coordination, consultation, and close partnership with key stakeholders at all levels. To give you some historical perspective, in early 2016, the FAO strategic program on sustainability and strategy to improve agriculture and rural statistics joined forces to develop the pioneer methodology for the then tier three SDG indicator 2.4.1 to measure progress towards target 2.4. Now, as many of you may know, defining and measuring sustainable agriculture, which is a multi-dimensional concept, is challenging as it is complex and country-specific, and thus, despite several attempts in the past 50 years, since 1970, has never been done before. Given the multi-dimensionality of the sustainability concept, FAO initiated a global discussion to deliberate the fundamental questions, that is, what sustainability means in the context of agriculture, what are its fundamental building blocks, what are the economic, social, and environmental uh, factors that, uh, that affect and are in turn affected by sustainability in agriculture, both in intertemporal and interspartial way aspects to keep as part of the framework and what to let go of and how to strike a balance between different sustainability issues faced by different uh, regions and countries. How it will be measured and monitored consistently over time using a framework and data collection tool uh, that, are, that are universal. As you will find out in the course of this training, the methodology is simple and involves uh, automatic rules to arrive at sustainability assessment of the country once the data has been collected, cleaned, processed, uh, and analyzed. The approved and endorsed methodology of SDG 241 is a result of this long participatory and consultative process that involved discussions with and contribution of thematic or subject matters experts, statisticians, policy makers, and researchers from institutions and Ministry of Agriculture, um, international organizations, civil society, private sector, and academia on this very issue. Uh, the reason behind us involving key stakeholders with diverse backgrounds was to make sure that this indicator is owned by everybody, especially countries. The current methodology of SDG 241 embodies this principle that is, it is universal, policy relevant, and practical. The way the methodology of this multi-dimensional indicator is designed, and you will see that as we progress during this training, it's very simple, logical, and, uh, and easy to implement. This was to ensure sustainability of the indicator monitoring over time at the, at the country level. So with this, uh, with this brief context, uh, let me begin the training now. SDG Goal 2, Zero Hunger, has five targets. The target that we are interested in today is 2.4, which is written in extenso here. As you can see, like many other SDG targets, this is uh, a very complex one. 
We highlighted in red some of the key aspects that needs to be captured as we try to measure progress towards this target. Sustainability, resilience, productivity, production, and environmental consideration. It's climate change, soil quality, etc. All in one single target. Clearly, uh, this would require an approach that captures these different dimensions or aspects. The indicator that was submitted to IAEG SDG and was approved in March 2015 is proportion of agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture or SDG 241. The indicator is now tier two, which means that the methodology of the indicator has now been approved and endorsed in October 2018 uh, with further refinements in the biodiversity um, sub indicator endorsed in November 2019. However, in general, data is uh, uh, not yet available or partially available uh, um, uh, as for country reporting is concerned. The formula we propose to measure the indicator is very simple and straightforward. It is uh, area under productive and sustainable agriculture divided by the agriculture land area. So, let us focus on the denominator first, the agriculture land area, which is defined as uh, arable land plus permanent crops and permanent meadows and pastures. It is a well-known and established concept uh, that is collected by statistical bodies uh, in countries and compiled internationally via a questionnaire by FAO and is disseminated through FAO Stat, which is an online uh, platform um, developed by FAO, whereby apart from um, uh, uh, issues related to agricultural land area, you will, you will see many other thematic dom domains which are tracked uh, on a yearly basis for all the member states. The issue obviously is with the numerator of the formula. How do we measure area under productive and sustainable agriculture? Now, what, it, what was clear from the description of the target, um, we have to look at sustainability across its uh, three dimensions, that is economic, social, and environmental. Meaning the agriculture land area under productive and sustainable agriculture will be the agriculture area of those farms that satisfy the sustainability criteria of that have been selected across all three dimensions of, uh, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this indicator. Here are the steps that were used in the methodological development of SDG 241. First, we discussed and chose the scale of assessment. For 241, the choice made was to adopt a bottoms up approach, whereby we selected farm or agriculture holding level sustainability that is then in turn aggregated to national or subnational level. Then we determined the scope of activities of the holding to be covered by this uh, indicator and the choice made for 241 was to cover crops and livestock uh, production systems. We reviewed the dimensions to be covered and uh, we decided to stick to the classical dimension of sustainability that is economic, social, uh, and, and environmental uh, in, in, the, in the sustainability assessment. Let me add here, in the beginning of the process, when uh, we embarked on the development of the indicators methodology, we selected five dimensions that included, in addition to the three that I already mentioned, two other dimensions uh, uh, that are institutional or governance and resilience. However, later on, it was decided to integrate resilience with the economic, environment, uh, environmental, and social dimensions, and to drop the governance dimension as we, we are exclusively focused on farm level assessments. We then zoomed into inside the dimensions into what we call themes or, uh, or aspects, and then in turn uh, selected the sub indicators that are needed to measure the progress within each team. Then we established sustainability criteria, also known as threshold uh, values or cutoff points for each sub-indicator 
to classify the farms and the agriculture area it owns or operates by assigning it red, yellow, or green statuses, which we call the traffic light approach that we will cover in the upcoming slide in more detail. And the next uh, decision for us was selection of the data collection instrument for collecting and reporting data on the indicator. And the choice made for uh, 241 was uh, farm survey. We also discussed and decided on the periodicity uh, or frequency for data collection and reporting for SCG 241, which is set at three years. And finally, the modality for reporting the indicator uh, for this, we developed both a dashboard approach where all the sub-indicators or themes are presented in one chart, uh, uh, where each sub-indicator is illustrated separately by sustainability status using the traffic light approach. But we also developed an aggregate SDG 241 for dashboard. The principles that were used to develop the indicator. First, policy uh, relevance, actionability. We wanted to make sure that every sub-indicator selected as part of SCG 241 had a meaning for the policymaker and thus provided information based on which informed decision can be taken to improve the uh, prevailing situation. Meaning the sub-indicators must be easily understood. Obviously, the reason why uh, these were selected and the results easily interpreted by policymakers. For example, is agri agriculture sustainability increasing or decreasing and why? And which policies needs to be implemented to address these issues? Universality and comparability are fundamental. We are in SDG process, a universal process. Thus, we needed to make sure that, that the indicator is valid every, everywhere. It must be relevant for all countries in the world, both for developing and developed. Measurability and cost effectiveness uh, were very high. Uh, trying to find the right balance between an ideal indicator from the subject matter perspective and one that can be easily measured consistently with a reasonable cost at the national level. The affordability of the indicator in terms of data collection and reporting was our topmost uh, priority. Uh, and finally, the minimum cross correlation between the sub indicators. So, in selecting a limited set of themes and sub indicators, efforts were made to reduce cross correlation between different sub indicators. Obviously, high cross correlation between sub indicators would imply that two or more sub-indicators capture the same sustainability theme. And in this case, the inclusion of one single sub-indicator instead of several would be sufficient to adequately measure agriculture sustainability performances. Um, all these decisions had uh, implication for the choice of sub-indicator uh, for the different dimensions, the choice of sustainability criteria for each sub-indicator, and obviously level of uh, uh, sophistication in, in data collection. With regards to the measurement scope, as we are interested in assigning agriculture area sustainability statuses at the farm level, the basic unit of observation and measurement are farms or agricultural holdings with focus on those that primarily produce crops and livestock or its mix to check as to whether these are economically feasible, environmental friendly, and socially acceptable. So we include both intensive, extensive, and subsistence agriculture holding, as long as their primary activities are crops and livestock or its mix. These may include both food and non-food products, and as well uh, holdings focused on crops uh, that are grown for fodder or energy purposes. The secondary activities uh, like aquaculture and agroforestries are considered only if these take place on the agriculture area of the farm as secondary activities. Um, in terms of what is out of scope, 
holding that are exclusively focused on um, on um, uh, aquaculture or agroforestry for for the holding for which these two activities are primary activities that will be excluded as uh, uh, from the scope of SG241 and as well we excluded production from gardens backyards uh, and 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 hobby farms uh, food harvested from the wild is also out of scope an important point to remember is that we are focused on agricultural land area of the holdings as defined by international classification systems meaning we exclude common lands that are not exclusively managed by the holding and the holding that that are engaged in nomadic pastoralism which is a practice of rearing livestock by moving uh, with the animals from one place to another in in search of a pasture it's a way of life uh, for people who do not uh, live continually in the same place but uh, move quickly uh, shortly of area to another um, seasonally or uh, uh, depending on the timing of the year. Um, the periodicity or reporting frequency of the indicator, as I mentioned earlier, is set at three years due to various uh, consideration. First, the SEG indicator 241 measure progress towards more productive and sustainable agriculture. And for many sub-indicators selected, it's unlikely that their values will change from one year to another and secondly the three-year data collection and reporting will enable countries to have at least three data points on the indicator before 2030 this will in turn help them make historical trend to assess their performance over time and uh, compare it with uh, with, with other uh, peers or other countries and uh, one other factor behind us choosing the three-year periodicity was obviously to reduce data collection and reporting burden on the on the member states or the countries as mentioned earlier SDG indicator 241 a current methodology is designed whereby information is collected uh, through farm surveys sustainability assessments are made at the farm level and the, and the final results are expressed as uh, at a national uh, at a national level as a national value however the methodology is scale independent and can be adopted for any geographical or administrative level though any introduction or additional uh, uh, of additional certification variables will certainly have implications uh, for the sample size and that's the cost of uh, data collection, uh, processing, and analysis. Um, in order to further enrich analysis for informed policy makers, policy making, the indicators can be disaggregated at uh, at a subnational level, um, and according to uh, types of farm as to whether the, uh, you know the particular agriculture holding is uh, operating in a household or non-household sector the type of production activities as to whether this agriculture holding is focused primarily on crops or primarily on livestock or a mix of both crops and livestock um, and thirdly as to whether the, the the agriculture holding is using water for irrigation uh, some other ca characteristics uh, a farms uh, can also be used for further disaggregation of the of the results um, by by size uh, or by gender of the of the uh, old. Now, as mentioned earlier, the indicator is multi-dimensional. This slide presents a table or a matrix that includes everything that we need to know about this indicator. Towards the extreme left you can see that the indicator cut across the three dimensions of sustainability economic social and environmental within each dimension we have a theme um, we have a team for instance as you can see within the economic dimension we have uh, three themes or aspects uh, and corresponding three sub indicators that are used to measure uh, the prog progress within that respective theme 
likewise uh, we have five teams in the environmental dimension and five corresponding uh, sub indicators uh, to measure progress within these uh, within these teams and uh, we have three teams in the social dimension and corresponding three sub indicators in the social uh, dimension so in total we have 11 teams and 11 sub indicators this decision was of course in relation to the measurability and cost effectiveness uh, of the indicator um, as the list of issues and themes and the sub indicators to measure and monitor is much longer uh, that could be considered or captured however there was a feeling that capturing 11 in total would be a very good step forward another very important uh, consideration uh, to take note of is that we have developed a universal framework that covers the entire spectrum of agriculture, uh, confronting uh, different sustainability issues that varies from one country to another or from one region to another within the same country, or uh, one type of agriculture production system to another, that is household and non-household sector, and thus not all sub-indicators are applicable to all kinds of farming systems. So as you can see here, within the social dimension, we have two sub indicators uh, that are applicable to a certain kind of uh, agriculture holdings. We will discuss this in detail as part of the, as part of the next presentation. Um, additionally, the recall or reference period for all the indicators vary, varies for the reason that I explained earlier. Sustainability is a structural concept and thus uh, would require a much longer time period to assess the problems or issues and make judgments about the performance of the farm. So as you can see here in the very last column, for some of the sub indicators, the reference period or the recall period is set at three years. And uh, we will discuss this as part of the presentation we, when we will dive deep into the methodology of uh, each sub indicator in more detail. As I said earlier, the hardest choice was to limit the framework of SDG 241 to 11 themes and sub indicators. A series of expert discussion in meetings, consultations, um, and literature review uh, have shown that sustainability is so complex that it is considered and used to capture sustainability in agriculture. In this slide, you can see some issues that are considered important but are not captured in SDG 241 framework. We still recommend countries to consider these themes if these are relevant um, in their national or subnational context in order to assess the sustainability of their agriculture at a national or subnational level. But primarily from SDG 241 uh, reporting perspective, uh, we would, uh, we would uh, want countries to stick to the 11 themes or 11 sub indicators that I showed you on the previous slide. One critical aspect, uh, aspect that was uh, that we will discuss in detail as part of each sub indicator in the next presentation was the development or establishment of thresholds or sustainability criteria that are used to assign sustainability statuses to each farm and the agriculture area that it owns, manages, or operates. Briefly, these uh, threshold or sustainability criteria are national policy based or international targets or science based absolute or relative values or levels below or above which for each sub indicator the farm is assigned sustainability status so for each sub indicator a criteria to assess sustainability level were developed now in order to capture the concept of continuous progress towards sustainability a traffic light approach was devised in which three sustainability levels are considered for each sub indicator. So green, desirable, yellow, uh, acceptable, and red, unsustainable. The traffic light approach acknowledges the trade-offs existing between sustainability dimensions and themes, and the need to find an acceptable balance between them. So just to reiterate, each sub indicator is assessed at the level of agriculture holdings, 
and thereafter the sustainability level is associated with the agriculture land area of that particular farm or agriculture holding and then um, these agriculture areas um, uh, with assigned sustainability status Recollecting from the previous slide, the reporting of SD241 can be done at various levels using both uh, a dashboard and aggregate indicator. Uh, what we require countries to report on is the dashboard and the aggregate indicator at the national level. Now, what makes the dashboard approach more appealing is that it helps visualize the performances across the dimension as well as across independent teams or sub-indicators separately. This makes the dashboard policy relevant and actionable for policymakers. The reason being that it gives the policymakers the tools, uh, the tool to quickly check at a single glance where the major problem lies, where to put in emphasis, what policies need to be put in place to address, to, to address the issue, to improve the situation. And, uh, and ultimately to move towards more sustainable agriculture. Of course, an added advantage of the dashboard is that it allows the possibility to combine um, or integrate data from, uh, from uh, different uh, sources. So as you can see here, this is a fictitious uh, or made up example of uh, country X in year Y. The, all the 11 sub-indicators when the data is collected, process and sustainability uh, levels are assigned uh, to the agriculture areas of the respective farm based on the sustainability criteria that have been chosen for each sub-indicator. Um, we can, we can um, uh, come up with, uh, with a dashboard like this, both at, both at the national and sub-national level. Now at the horizontal axis, we are making or the sub-indicators, and on the vertical axis, we, we measure the proportion of uh, agriculture uh, area. So as you can see from this dashboard, you can, at a single glance, you can see as to where, where the major problem is across the 11 sub-indicators in terms of the sustainability themes or sub-indicators. So for this example, as you can see here, the, the, the most problematic uh, uh, sub-indicator or theme is profitability which shows 40% uh, um, unsustainable agriculture area. Now, I mentioned to you that 241 can be reported using both a dashboard and then the aggregate indicator. The final aggregate SD241 is derived from the dashboard at the country level. It can be done directly uh, just by visualizing the dashboard. Um, just to corroborate further, the final number of 241 is the result of the sub-indicator that has recorded the highest unsustainability performance. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this can be done using both the dashboard uh, and using the formulas which are displayed on, uh, on, on this slide. Um, uh, so if we go back from here, you can really see as to as to which sub-indicator has recorded or reported the most unsustainable agriculture area. And hence, uh, the final number for aggregate 241 will be, will be, uh, will be this one, 40%. Now, the performances of countries over time can be measured by change in the proportion of agriculture area that is unsustainable. Okay. So the maximum unsustainable agriculture area across the 11 uh, sub-indicator, or it can be also captured using the minimum uh, sustainable uh, agriculture area, which is, which is uh, um, uh, an aggregation of both acceptable and desirable. So if we go back here, so um, you know, one way is to look for the most unsustainable area, or the least uh, sustainable area, which is the, both the green and yellow combined. So we, 
we, we said in the beginning that policy relevance is an important consideration. In this respect, the dashboard uh, approach is really interesting um, as it provides um, a structured and transparent framework to measure and report on sustainable agriculture. It allows focus on main issues related to sustainability and encourage discussion by linking it to policy action. And lastly, it drives the policy towards uh, uh, agriculture sustainability issues with focus on intervention at various levels. Um, of course, uh, in terms of inter interpretation, the dashboard approach is easy to interpret in terms of the extent to which country agriculture is far from being productive and sustainable. And it is very easy to identify and prioritize the area that requires, that requires intervention. I will stop here. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions regarding the content that we have covered up until now. Stefania, the floor is, uh, is yours. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. So, in the previous presentation, uh, we learned about the conceptual and methodological basis of SDG 241. That is its scope, which is crops and livestock or a mix of both. Uh, it's coverage, um, themes, 11 themes, sub indicators, 11 sub indicators, periodicity, three years, and reporting to FAO. In this uh, session, we will go through the 11 themes uh, and 11 respective uh, sub-indicators, uh, particularly focus on the rationale for selection of the theme and the sub-indicators, the data items required to construct the sub-indicators, the sustainability criteria to develop uh, to assign the farm and its agriculture area, the green, uh, yellow, or red statuses, or the traffic light approach as we, as we call it. So as highlighted earlier, uh, SG241 is defined using the formula, which is area under productive and sustainable agriculture divided by the agriculture land area. So just to refresh uh, what we covered in the previous presentation, let us focus on the uh, which is based on FAO uh, land use classes. As such, countries provide national level statistics annually via the relevant FAO state questionnaire to FAO. Uh, very importantly, the same land use classes are collected by census, which automatically addresses the issue of common land. So common land, because it's not part of the scope of 241, uh, if we go by the, by the FAO land use classes, it, it's going to be automatically excluded. In other words, the agriculture census does not focus, uh, uh, does focus on farms only just like 241 and exclude common land along the lines of SG 241. So it's a, it's a well-established concept, which is derived by adding crop land and land under permanent meadows and pastures. Uh, one important point to keep in mind is that uh, for the estimation of agricultural land area, we adhere to the system of uh, environmental agriculture for stream fisheries and the World Census of Agriculture 2020 Standards and Classification Systems. So this is just to, to uh, tell you, so we are interested in agricultural land area, which is an addition of crop land plus uh, land under permanent metals and pastures. Another important point to take note of is that the land tenor of the agriculture holding particularly from SG241 point of view, the scope include the entire agriculture land area of the holding. Um, but there are few qualifications, uh, and that is if the agriculture land area is owned and operated by the holding, um, if it is rented in, or if it is other land borrowed for free or occupied, then it will be part of the scope of SG241. Um, common land, as I mentioned earlier, if those are managed exclusively by the holding without sharing it with the rest of the community, then it will be part of the scope of SG241. Otherwise, it will be uh, out of scope. Um, the land which is owned by the holding, but it is rented out, is out of the scope of the indicator. Okay. So just to exemplify, here is um, um, four parcels. 
uh, of land owned by a given agriculture holding. So parcel one is owned and used. So this will be part of the scope of SDG 241. Parcel two is owned and used as well, this will be part of the scope of SDG 241 from land tenure perspective. Parcel four, it's not owned by the whole thing, but you know, the, uh, the farm is renting in another holding, which will be part of the scope of SDG 241. While parcel three, which is owned by the holding, but it's rented out to another agriculture holding, will, will not be considered as, as part of the sustainability assessment of that particular farm. I hope this is uh, this is clear. So before going into the details of respective sub indicators, uh, let me provide you, um, um, let me illustrate once again, the framework of SG241, the three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental, and the uh, 11 themes and 11 respective uh, sub indicators, as well as the applicability of, uh, of the sub indicators to uh, some kind of uh, farming systems, and as well the reference period, which, which, which is, or which is, uh, which is different for, for some uh, uh, sub indicators. And I will explain to you as to why in, in, the, in the coming slides. So before going into the details of respective sub indicators, let me provide you the gen with the generic steps that will be used to estimate uh, each uh, sub indicator. So assuming once relevant qualitative information is collected through agriculture service and thereafter checked, cleaned, validated and stored on a computer as Excel spreadsheets or you know and stored using some other platform, uh, it must then be transformed into appropriate quantitative primary variables uh, that are in turn used to construct the 11 sub indicators of SCG 241. Uh, a set of scripts and procedures typically carried out with statistical software like Stata, SPSS, R, or, or any other are applied to the survey data for constructing the primary variables that will in turn uh, that in, in turn are combined to construct the 11 sub indicators. So we will, we will go through these steps as part of each sub indicator. So it will become more clearer to you. So the first sub indicator in the, or the first theme uh, and the sub indicator in the economic dimension is land the sub indicator that has been chosen to measure progress uh, within this theme land productivity is farm output value uh, per hectare. Now, land productivity is, is a measure of agriculture value of output obtained on a given area of land uh, for a given time period. At a farm level, the land productivity reflects technology and production processes for a given agroecological condition or a region. In a broader sense, an increase in the level of land productivity enables higher production per unit of land, and which may result in, in, uh, in higher revenues and, 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 and thus, uh, and thus uh, higher, higher profits. Land productivity is driven by a combination of multiple factors, which include climate, soil, topography, land use, um, and, and management. In, in addition, uh, land productivity varies not only in space, but also in time. This variability in land productivity occurs at different time scales, from seasonal, from seasonal to interannual, um, in, in, in response to variability in many factors, such as, uh, such as rainfall and others. In the context of 241, we use the same classical approach to estimate land productivity. That is, first, the farm output uh, value in local currency unit is estimated, uh, which is then divided by the agricultural land area, um, measured using uh, um, the classes which I just defined, um, typically in hectares. Um, and lastly, the farm productivity is then compared with the farm output value of hectares of the 
or distribution of the farms to assign the farm, the particular agriculture holding green, yellow, and red statuses. For this sub indicator, one, we are interested in the following uh, um, uh, data items. So the formula um, uh, is very simple, farm output value per hectare is farm output value divided by agriculture land area in hectares. Um, what, what we are interested in, in for us to estimate the farm output value, we need the quantities, physical quantities of the products produced and as well the farm gate prices at which these products are sold by the agriculture holding. Uh, in the context of 241, um, we recommend countries to, uh, uh, you know, basically collect information at a farm level for five main crops and the byproducts produced by the holding in a reference period. Um, five main livestock and its products uh, produced by, by the holding in a reference period and other on-farm products produced by the holding in a reference period, provided if this holding is engaged in secondary activities, which I explained in my previous uh, uh, presentation, uh, like say, for example, aquaculture or, or agroforestry. Now, the actual number of, um, of the products produced will, of course, vary by from one holding to another. So there will be holding which will be producing only one product. There will be others which will be producing uh, more than five products. So this number, I mean, it's uh, uh, countries can decide as to as to when they want to stop. Uh, in terms of the number of products that they, they want to collect information on at the holding level. But ide ideally, I mean, our recommendation is to, to go up until five uh, main products. Then the, so, so, so first, I mean, we would need the physical quantities and farm gate prices. This will give us the value of output in, in local currency unit, which is the numerator for estimation of land productivity. Then of course, we need the uh, agriculture land area. Of the, of the farm, which I explained to you earlier in, in the previous slide. So for that, we need agriculture land area, which is a summation of crop land plus land under permanent meadows and pastures. And um, we, would, we would like countries to collect all this information in hectares. So if countries is using another unit of measurement for estimation of agriculture land area, like say for example, or maybe some other uh, from some other uh, local units, then they should use conversion factors for them to for them to convert those units into hectares, so that we have a standardized uh, um, um, uh, uh, value for, for for this formula, which is very much needed for uh, for uh, comparison of uh, of the farm productivities. Now, another very important uh, uh, point that I would like to highlight is that for this particular sub indicator and in general for the rest of uh, SE241, I mentioned to you that uh, FAO is recommending uh, uh, some disaggregation at, at the farm level. Um, so for this, I mean, uh, as I explained to you on in, in the previous presentation, we focus on three stratification variables, household and non-household sector. The second one is crop livestock and mixed uh, agriculture holding and the third one is as to whether this particular agriculture holding is using water for irrigating its agriculture area now the 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 reason behind us having different categories of farm is to compare apples with apples so let's say for example just to give you um, uh, uh, an illustration so if we are comparing the productivity of, of pre predominantly wheat producing um, agriculture holding with the one which is focused on um, on some exotic uh, uh, high priced uh, you know uh, fruits or vegetables then in that case it, it it won't make sense because the wheat producing farm uh, may be performing better if it is compared with other wheat producing farms rather than if it is compared with uh, with another farm which is focused or specialized in in some other agriculture activity like say for example livestock so in this case the wheat producing farm may persistently or may consistently um, uh, illustrate uh, uh, lower productivity in comparison to other farms so from this perspective i mean we we we, we believe that this stratification of farms 
will will enrich uh, uh, the analysis of SG241 to arrive at a better estimation of the indicator for, for the different categories. So once we, once we estimate the farm output value per hectare at a given agriculture holding level for each category of farm, the, uh, then what we do is we comparing the productivity of a given farm with the rest of the distribution to which this farm belongs to see as to how the farm is performing vis-a-vis -vis its, uh, vis -vis its um, with other farms in the group. Um, here is an example of typical crops and uh, byproducts produced by a given holding. Of course, uh, the situation, uh, the, the list of the crops and the byproducts produced will vary from one country to another and from one region to another within, within, a, within a given country. So this is just an illustration, uh, just, a, just an example um, that uh, um, uh, these are the crops or byproducts that we uh, that the that countries may want to focus on in terms of uh, collecting information on the physical quantities and prices farm gate prices of of, uh, of this uh, variable um, this slide summarizes the list of other on farm products and activities that the holding may carry out again as secondary activity alongside its primary activities which is predominantly production of crops or production of livestock and uh, uh, its products the list here is taken from international standard industrial classification revision 4 uh, now depending on whether these um, other on farm activities or commodities contribute to the farm revenues if yes then it must be included in the estimation of farm output value or else it can be it can be ignored. So, as I was uh, explaining earlier, the recommended certification is, you know, at the holding level, household and non-household sector. The activity type for the holding could be crop, mixed or livestock, and then as to whether you know this holding is using water to irrigate uh, the agricultural land area. So based on this combination, we can categorize, uh, we can have 12 different categories. So it could be household crops, irrigated. it could be household mix irrigated, it could be non-household crop irrigated and so on. So the reason again behind us classifying these farms into different categories is to then compare the productivities of each farm uh, belonging to this category with 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 the, with the other farms in, in in this particular group to to have um, to have more uh, realistic uh, uh, sustainability assessment. So, in the first step, um, this is an example um, for a given farm. The output value is estimated by first multiplying the quantities of each crop livestock and its byproducts uh, by its farm gate prices. These measures are expressed in local currency units and represents the numerator of the sub indicator for a particular farm and is then divided by the agricultural land area of that farm, which is a denominator to calculate the farm output value per hectare. This is an example of uh, the data that we uh, basically uh, of the pilot exercise that we collected in uh, Bangladesh back in 2018-19. Um, uh, so for a given farm, I mean, let's say for example, uh, this is a holding identification number. So this holding was uh, producing uh, a certain kind of rice, which is, which is a local, which is a local uh, variety. The quantity produced in local currency unit was 80 units. The farm gate price per unit was uh, 750 per unit. And hence we start multiplying these to estimate the farm output value. And similarly, this farm not only produced this variety of rice, but it was producing another variety. Uh, why are we distinguishing amongst the different varieties of rice? Because the unit prices uh, are different. 
So some varieties could be very expensive, while others are more uh, are more reasonably priced. So hence, uh, you know, the the output value that is derived uh, for a given commodity may may differ uh, by different uh, varieties. Uh, it also produces maize. Uh, this was the quantity per unit and uh, and the unit price. And, and then we add up all these uh, um, uh, products produced. Uh, it's value of output to estimate the total value of output for that particular farm. Now, this is uh, very important. So once the farm output value per hectare has been calculated for all the farms that are, that are part of the sample. And of course, these farms, as I mentioned to you, first needs to be categorized by different types. Then each category of farm are ordered from lowest to highest. Uh, um, and then once we order these uh, farms within each category from based on their farm output value per hectare, we identify the uh, corresponding 90th percentile uh, using, using this very simple formula. Now I will, I will tell you as to why we are um, basically estimating the 90th percentile because we use this information um, then to assign sustainability statuses to the farm based on their productivity performance vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the group to which it belong or the category to which it belongs. So we identify the 90th percentile, which for this uh, fictitious or made up example is 600, right? Um, then what we do is uh, we uh, derive from this, uh, from this 600 um, productivity, which is associated with the 90th percentile, two third of the 90th percentile and one third of the 90th percentile, which is very easy calculation. We multiply this by two third and then again by one third to establish the two thresholds. And now, once we establish these two thresholds, then these are used to then assign the farm green, yellow, and red statuses based on their productivity performances. So, um, these two thresholds are then used to assign green, yellow, and red statuses, as, as I mentioned earlier. And as well, once we assign the farm, the sustainability status, by default, we are assigning the agriculture area that it owns or operates the sustainability status. Um, so uh, in this case, the farm is classified as green. If the farm output value per hectare for a given farm is equal to or greater than the value corresponding to the two-third of the percentile, estimated for the distribution of categories of farm with this farm belongs. Again, uh, the farm will be classified as yellow or acceptable. If the farm output value per hectare is equal to or greater than the value corresponding to the one third, but less than the two third of the 90th percentile. And the farm will be classified as red if the farm output value per hectare is less than the value corresponding to the one third of the 90th percentile. So based on, based on these um, arithmetic values, then we start assigning farms the green, yellow, and red statuses. So just to, again, uh, an example. So for this particular category of farm, which is crop household, uh, uh, an agriculture holding focus in, focused on crops belonging to household sector, uh, which is irrigating uh, its agricultural land area. So for this group, the 90th percentile was estimated to be 600. The two third of the 90th percentile um, is, is uh, derived to be 400, and one third of the 90th percentile is 200. And likewise, we do the same for the other categories of, uh, of uh, agriculture holdings. And we, we estimate the two third and one third threshold. Now, based on the Bangladesh example, uh, uh, which, which I referred to earlier, the land productivity from, 
for, for this particular agriculture holding is, was estimated to be 900 which belongs to crop household sector irrigated. The 90th percentile value for this category is 600. The two third of the 90th percentile is 400 and the one third is 200. So based on the rule that we all already established on this slide, uh, you know, so 900 is greater than two third, of, two, two third of the 90th percentile, hence it will be classified as green. For holding two, its productivity is 300, which is falling between the two third and the one third uh, of the 90th percentile. Hence, it will be classified as yellow. And for the third holding, the um, uh, land productivity is estimated to be 200. Uh, and for this group, the one third and the two third of the 90th percentile is 467 and 233, uh, respectively which is lower than the one third of the 90th percentile and hence it will be classified as unsustainable or red. I will stop here. If you have any question, please, please feel free to ask. Okay, no questions so far. We leave a few seconds to everybody. Uh, before Aspandayar goes with the next uh, sub indicators, if you have any doubts on this first one, you are free um, to ask questions at this point. Uh, um, in the meantime, Aspandayar, uh, you want to finish the economic before breaking, right? Yes, yes. Okay, even if we are a little bit uh, late. Okay, it seems we don't have any questions, so you can go on and then uh, we see if something comes up later. One the last step, uh, which I would like uh, to basically emphasize. So once we classify the holdings, green, yellow, and red, based on the criteria that we have chosen for this uh, particular sub-indicator, then what we do is we aggregate all the farms and its agriculture area that are assigned green status, yellow status, and red status. And then we divide the green, yellow, and red by the nationally representative uh, agriculture uh, area of the entire country, which is of course uh, estimated uh, using the same information which is collected using the agriculture survey, the same agriculture survey, for us to estimate the proportion for uh, uh, as to how much area based on based on this sub-indicator is uh, green, yellow, or red. So, um, an important point, a part of sustainability in agriculture is the economic viability of the farms, uh, which is driven to a larger extent by its profitability. In the context of 241, profitability is measured using uh, the net farm income that the farmer is able to earn from farming operations. Availability and use of information on farm economic performance, um, much using profitability, will support better decisions uh, making both at the micro and uh, macro economic levels. Um, since performance me measures drive behavior, better information on performances can alter behavior and decision making by the government and producers both in the large scale commercial farming and medium and small scale uh, subsistence or traditional agriculture. Now, one important point that I would like to highlight is that the reference period for this particular sub-indicator is last three calendar year. And now I'll explain to you as to why we have chosen uh, a, a different uh, reference period for, uh, for net farm income sub-indicator. Now, the SDG 2 for 1 provides two options or approaches to countries to, on how to report on this sub-indicator. A sophisticated approach, which we recommend, and a simple approach, uh, which is based on farmer declaration. So I'll explain in term as to what I mean by these two approaches. So using the sophisticated approach, the net farm income is calculated using the following formula. Uh, this formula, mind you, is adopted from Statistics Canada. 
uh, and it's uh, it's widely used um, um, by by many countries uh, if they are interested in estimation of uh, net farm income or profitability at, uh, at at the farm level. So NFI is of course is an abbreviation for net farm income. Uh, CR is total farm cash receipts, including direct program payments from the government in support of the farming operations, like say, for example, subsidies or support prices. YK is the income in kind, which is, um, uh, which is uh, uh, basically um, uh, uh, given to the farm for, for, for its, um, for its uh, activities uh, that it's performing. By, by other agricultural holdings, and I'm, I'm going to explain this to you as well. Um, OE is total operating expenses after rebates, including labor cost. Um, uh, DEP is depreciation, and uh, delta INV is value of inventory change. Now, the the sophisticated approach, which is, um, I, again, let me reiterate, it, it is adopted from Statistics Canada, is recommended. However, its use um, by the country is made conditional on the fact if data on farm financial records that are documented or recorded daily, weekly, monthly, um, on, on monthly basis are available. In general, large scale commercial farms maintain detailed financial records using which the net farm income can be easily calculated. The farm financial records are not usually maintained by traditional or small scale um, agriculture farm holdings. So in this case, I will explain to you as to, as to how can you use the simpler version which I, which I mentioned to you earlier uh, uh, in my slide. So very easy. So value of output, for us to estimate that, so we need total farm cash receipts plus direct program payments plus income in kind plus change in inventory chain. Now, total farm cash receipts, it's what? It's total value of output of the farm, um, which is quantity into prices for crops, livestock, and other on-farm activities or product produced. Direct program payments, I explained to you earlier, that these are the payments which are given by the government to the farmer in terms of subsidies or support prices. Income in kind is something which, uh, like say for example, if the given agriculture holding uh, has provided some kind of expertise and agriculture holding, and then that agriculture holding, instead of paying the farm in cash, they have paid him in, in, in a certain physical units of wheat or maize or, or, or some other agriculture product. And value of inventory change is the amount of um, um, amount of um, uh, commodities uh, at the beginning and at the end of the year, which usually the value of inventory change is calculated for uh, for uh, for livestock, um, which is um, a more sophisticated approach in terms of arriving at the actual value of the livestock uh, sector at the end of the year. So we take the initial stock at the beginning of the year, then we see as to how many of the livestock uh, were born, uh, got died, or slaughtered, or given away as gift, or received as gift, and then we estimate the balance at the end of the year. And then using the, the prices prevailing uh, uh, at that point in time, in that particular area in which the farm is operating, we estimate the total value of uh, livestock of that particular agriculture holding. Now in terms of cost, uh, for this more sophisticated approach, we, we take into account um, operating plus fixed plus uh, depreciation. So operating expenses include labor, labor, labor expenses, which is cash wages or in-kind wages, fertilizer expenses, pesticide expenses, fuel expenses, electricity expenses, cost of or feeding animal if it is a livestock farm, irrigation costs, taxes, depreciation charges, and, uh, and others. I mean, if you, if you need to understand more about this more sophisticated approach, I have provided a link here. You can always go to this uh, link for you, to, for you to access more information on each head as to, as to uh, how it is calculated or estimated. But it's fairly straightforward. Now, 
Now, I was mentioning the simplified option. The simplified option part, we are offering two approaches for the simplified options as well. Um, so these are to be used when the detailed data are not available at the farm level. As I, as I uh, mentioned earlier, it's better adopted to small holders or household sector. So in this case, what we uh, recommend countries to collect information on is output quantity, I mean the physical quantity, again, the farm gate prices of crops and livestock in this broad products and byproducts, whether marketed or self-consumed, okay? Uh, operating expenses, including input quantities and its market prices, and output quantity and farm gate prices of other on-farm activities carried out on the agriculture holding, again, aquaculture or agroforestry, in addition to crops and livestock, provided if these are practiced by the farm as secondary activities. And then, of course, we need information on input quantities and prices utilized in the production of uh, those on farm products. For this option, the simplified option one, um, we, we ignore or we don't consider the depreciation and value of inventory change, which is very data demanding and time consuming. Uh, the second simplified option that we uh, propose uh, as uh, for uh, for estimation of uh, uh, net farm income sub-indicator is, um, is very straightforward. We just ask the respondent or the holder of the agriculture holding about his declaration on the agriculture holdings profitability over the last three calendar years. Um, this, uh, last, the, this second simplified option is used in case of SEG indicator 2.4.1 survey questionnaire that we have developed and we are gonna, I'm gonna show that to you tomorrow. And we have already tested, uh, you know, this approach in, in Bangladesh and it works uh, just fine. Now, so once we collect all this information using either the sophisticated approach or, uh, or any of the two simpler approaches, then what we do is, we see as to whether the farm profitability or net farm income was above zero for the past three consecutive years. So if it, if it was above zero for the past three consecutive year, then we classified it as green. If it was uh, um, between, um, uh, if it was above zero for uh, uh, at least one of the past three consecutive years, then it is uh, classified as yellow. And if the profitability uh, is below zero for all three past consecutive years, then it's classified as, as red. So um, in case of Bangladesh, because we, we uh, resorted to the simplified option two, we are the respondent for the last three years, last two years, or none of the, none of the three years. Um, holding one was uh, profitable in two of, out of three years, so hence it was classified as yellow. Holding two was profitable in three out of three years, and it was classified as desirable or green. And holding one at one was unprofitable in all three years, and it was classified as unsustainable. So we assign the holdings, and by default, associate this sustainability assessment with the agriculture area of that holding, we then start adding up the area which, is, which, which are classified as green, yellow, and red, okay? Which in case of the Bangladesh example, uh, pilot tests um, was amounting to 237.5 hectares. Um, for yellow, it was 250, and for the red, it was 22.3 hectares. Then we start dividing the, the green, yellow, and red res respectively by the total agriculture land area of the country, which is derived from the sample survey for us to calculate the proportion of uh, area um, for, for, for this sub-indicators, uh, you know, using the traffic light approach. Any questions? Not. So we can go to the last sub indicators and then we stop for a few minutes. Okay. 
So the third and the final sub-indicator in the economic dimension is risk mitigation mechanisms. The theme is resilience, okay? And the reference period is uh, last calendar year. Um, resilience has emerged as a key factor in sustainability. Um, it encompasses absorptive, anticipatory, and adoptive capacities and refers to the properties of the system that allow farms to deal with external shocks and stresses to persist and to continue to be well functioning. Um, in the context of um, two for one, the following talks are uh, considered uh, uh, drought, which is a prolonged period of abnormally low rainfall leading to a shortage of water, flood, and which is an overflow of large amount of water beyond its normal limits especially or what is normally dry land. Pests, which is a destructive insect or other animal attack um, on, on crops, uh, food, livestock, etc. This uh, can also include heat waves and market shocks or market failures, uh, which is any demand or supply shock that alter the price uh, matching equilibrium in the market. Uh, uh, which, which leads to price reduction for the commodities produced by the holding. So as a shock uh, coping mechanism or mitigation strategy so that the farm continues to be sustainable, the SE 241 proposed that the holding for a yield insurance, which is a preventive protection measure to protect the holding against external shocks has access to or availed credit, both uh, which, may, which may have been obtained from formal or informal sources, such as banks, relatives, or local money lenders, and the fact um, if the farm is diversified. Um, that is, if the share of the single agriculture commodity produced or activity carried out at the holding level is not greater than 66% in its total value of production of the holding. So the, the third, um, the third um, criteria, so you know, the first one is as to whether the holding has access to or availed insurance, access to or availed credit, and on-farm diversification, as I mentioned, um, can be readily calculated using this indicator, especially for this formula, is again coming from, this is the same information that was collected for the productivity and the profitability sub-indicator. So we need the total value uh, of production for uh, for all the commodities and then we, we need the total value of production of the entire farm and based on this formula we can really see as to whether the farm is diversified so if the value of this formula is above 66 percent this means that the farm is not diversified it is dependent on or rely too much on one single commodity for its uh, for its revenue throughout the year and hence it is more susceptible and vulnerable to external shocks in terms of uh, market failure, in terms of droughts, in terms of uh, uh, any other, uh, in terms of pest, pest attacks. Um, if, if the value of this um, particular formula is lower than, uh, than 66%, this means that the revenue stream is not dependent on one single commodity. So in terms of sustainability criteria that we have chosen or selected for this sub-indicator, a farm holding is considered resilient if it has a will or access, uh, or has the means to access the risk mitigation mechanisms as follows. So it will be classified as green if it has access to or availed two uh, of the three mitigation mechanisms, which I just spoke about. It will be classified as yellow if it has access to or availed at least one of the three mitigation mechanisms and it will be classified as red if it has access to uh, none of the three mitigation uh, mechanisms. So again, based on the pilot study that we conducted in Bangladesh back in 2018 and 19, as you can see, uh, here is the analysis of results. So the first column, which is on farm diversification. Uh, in fact, the first three columns are on farm diversification. So you can see that the share of the commodity um, uh, number one in output value is 76%, which is well above 
the 66 percent that we have selected for uh, for as a threshold for us to classify the farm to be diversified or non-diversified so hence this farm scores zero in terms of uh, diversification um, do they have access to credit yes do they have access to insurance yes and hence this farm is classified as green based on the criteria that we have chosen that i showed you on the previous slide this farm farm number three is uh, very much diversified i mean it it is reliant on uh, three different commodities for its uh, value of output so it scores well on the farm diversification criteria but then it doesn't have any access to credit or any access to insurance Hence, it qualifies one of the three criteria for this particular sub-indicator. Hence, it is classi classified as yellow or acceptable. And farm number four, um, it is monoculture. They, 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 this particular farm is practicing monoculture. They are dependent only on one commodity. 100% of its value of output or revenue is coming from one single um, product or uh, one single activity. Um, and it has no access to credit and no access to insurance so it fails all the three criteria and hence it is classified as red or non-sustainable so again the last uh, the last uh, uh, step is is is, is uh, similar uh, as in case of all other sub indicators we then start aggregating the area classified as uh, um, green, yellow, red, and then we divide it by the nationally representative agriculture area of the entire country for us to estimate the proportions uh, under green, yellow, and red uh, on the traffic light. And I stop here, Stefania. Okay. So uh, we don't have any questions so far. Uh, I think that maybe participants need to think a little bit uh, or all what has been said so far. So since it's, we are a little bit late on the agenda, we break now for, uh, Sonia, what about five minutes maybe because you were a little bit late. So five minutes, uh, the floor is yours again. Okay, thank you, Stefania. So just before I start with the environmental dimension, I mean, let me, let me emphasize one thing. So we covered three sub-indicators in the economic dimension. And as you may have seen, most of the information that is collected for the for one of the sub indicator like say for example for for profitability or productivity is then used for 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 the other sub indicator as well so let's say for example if you collect information on the revenue stream and the cost stream uh, of a given agriculture holding uh, for you to estimate its profitability then by default you are covering the uh, the productivity indicator as well because it requires the same data items and variables of course, I mean, the, from analytical perspective, we will have to play with the numbers in a different way, but you need the same data. And to, to a larger extent, uh, uh, you know, partially the, the sub indicator on resilience will be covered as well, because the third criteria, which is on unfarm diversification, I mean, it requires the same data items or variables which are collected for the profitability or for productivity sub indicator. So what I'm trying to say is that it, it seems like uh, uh, a bit, uh, you know, once you once you think about these sub indicators in in isolation, one by one, you then you think that it's too data demanding. But but of, you know, in a way, all these sub indicators are interrelated because the uh, same data items are used to to report on uh, on different aspects of the of the holding. So. Um, the first sub indicator in the environmental dimension is prevalence of soil degradation. Uh, just to contextualize, FAO and uh, Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils have identified 10 main threats to soil health. Okay. Soil erosion, soil organic carbon losses, nutrient imbalance, acidification, contamination, water logging, uh, compaction, soil sealing, salinization, and loss of bio soil biodiversity. Uh, a careful review of the 10 threats to soil health shows that all except one, which is soil sealing, um, which is defined as uh, loss of soil, uh, loss of natural soil to construction or urbanization. All others are potentially and primarily affected by inappropriate agriculture practices. 
In the context of 241, we have selected four main threats to soil health that are universal across the globe. I mean, mind you, all these sub-indicators have been um, have been thoroughly deliberated, not only with thematic and subject matter experts, but with countries as well. So um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a collective effort which was uh, which was chaired by FAO, but we have taken into account the uh, the, the the say of uh, of countries, of uh, international organizations, institutions. So whatever you see as part of the methodological construction of these uh, sub indicators, uh, it's not that FAO is unilaterally uh, recommending it to countries, but it was a it was part of the process that was adopted by FAO. So uh, for this sub particular sub indicator, which is prevalence of soil degradation, the theme of course is soil health, uh, and the reference period is the last three calendar years. Uh, we have uh, identified these four major threats that according to experts are more universal uh, globally. Soil erosion, uh, which is uh, wearing away of the field topsoil by natural physical forces of water and wind. These can be affected, accelerated, or reduced as a function of farming activities such as tillage. Reduction in soil fertility, which refers to the capacity of the soil to provide crops with essential nutrients without reduction in productivity over the years. Reduction in soil fertility implies a situation in which uh, capacity of the soil uh, to provide crops with essential plant nutrients tend to reduce from one year to another. Water logging or uh, first salinization, which is salt accumulation on the land surface and water logging, which refers to a situation of water stagnation on the land surface or excessive volume of water on the land sur surface affecting production. Uh, in the context of um, this sub indicator, a simple question is, uh, is in a farm survey is asked to capture farmers knowledge or declaration about the situation of uh, agriculture holdings in terms of soil degradation. Uh, having said that, let me tell you upfront that ideally uh, all soil under agriculture land area in a country should be subject of periodic monitoring uh, in order to assess the impact of uh, agriculture on soil. Um, these uh, monitoring tools typically include maps, models, results from soil sampling or laboratory analysis, field surveys, um, existing report on soil and land degradation at the national level. However, uh, you know, we, we, we've been told in the process uh, as we were coordinating with countries, you know, soliciting their, uh, their, their feedback, that these data sources are usually very costly. Um, but if it exists, then it may either be used to complement the information collected through farm survey or to cross-check the farmer uh, responses. So the sustainability criteria that have been uh, selected for this sub indicator is uh, fairly straightforward. So I mentioned to you four um, four threats: soil erosion, reduction soil fertility, salinization, and water logging. And the criteria that we have selected is if the combined area affected by any of the four selected threats to soil, to soil health, in fact, is less than 10% of a total agricultural land area of the farm then it will be classified as green. Um, if the combined area affected by any of the four selected threats to soil health is between 10% and 50% of the total agricultural land area of the farm, then it is classified as yellow. And it is classified as red if the combined um, area affected by any of the four selected threats to soil, uh, to soil health is above 50% of the total agricultural land area of the farm. So, so it's a basic arithmetic. Once information is collected using um, the farm survey question, then it's very easy to assign the green, yellow, and red sustainability status. Now, again, the uh, example from Bangladesh. So, holding one, we asked them the question as to whether, you know, first the question was as to whether there are any um, issues in terms of soil health um, 
uh, in terms of the four threads that we have selected. So we got the answer for soil erosion, this holding say no. Reduction in soil fertility, yes. Water logging, yes. Hellenization, no. The total agricultural land area of this holding, holding one was 0.9. The total agriculture area affected according to the farmer declaration was uh, 0.40 hectares. It's a, you know, it's very easy to derive uh, the, the, the total area affected of the holding, which, was, which amounts to 45%. So we simply divide this by the total agricultural land area of that particular farm. Um, as you know, uh, let's let's go back here. So, the total area affected for that particular farm is as by these criteria, it falls in the in the yellow in the yellow status, and hence we classify it as yellow. Holding two, I mean, they said that they don't have any problems whatsoever at their agricultural holding level. The total agricultural land area of the holding was 0.20. The total agriculture effective is zero. The total area effective hence is zero. And hence this agriculture holding is uh, classified as uh, desirable. Another example, um, holding four, they said that we have soil erosion and reduction in soil fertility. Other two problems are non-existent. Total agricultural land area is 0.27. Total area affected is 0 0.20. It amounts to 74%. And hence this agriculture area is classified as non-sustainable. Because if you go here, if the combined area affected by any of the four selected threats to soil health is above 50%, then the farm holding is classified as, uh, as red. And again, the last uh, option is, um, is similar. Like in case of the other sub-indicator, we then aggregate the agriculture area the farms and its associated agriculture area by green, yellow, and red statuses. And then we start dividing it by the nationally representative agriculture land area of the country to arrive at the proportion of the agriculture area uh, using the traffic light approach. So um, agriculture, more specifically irrigated agriculture is by far the main um, economic sector using freshwater resources. Um, in many places, uh, water withdrawal from rivers and groundwater uh, is beyond what can be considered environmentally sustainable. Uh, sustainable agriculture therefore requires that the level of uh, use of fresh water for irrigation re remains within the acceptable boundaries. While there is no uh, internationally agreed standard of water use sustainability, Signal associated with unsustainable use of water typically include progressive reduction in the level of underground water. That is drying out of springs and rivers and also increased conflicts amongst the water users. The indicator, this, this particular sub-indicator in fact, captures the extent which agriculture contributes to unsustainable patterns of water use. Um, so, Irrigation use on the holding means that water, other than rain, is applied to crops at least once during the, during the reference period. To elaborate further, water can be sourced using different methods, using uh, well irrigation, uh, which is a method of irrigation where underground water is tapped through a well. It could either be a tube well or an open well. Or secondly, water supplied directly by diverting it from the rivers through canals using gravity or pumping it from the river, uh, lake or, um, uh, or uh, groundwater. Third, water can be applied on the field through sprinklers or micro irrigation or drip irrigation. So, um, and, 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 and hence, you know, this indicator not only stopped there, but it goes well beyond by, um, by taking into account water allocations as well. In many countries, water allocation to farms is implemented by organizations mandated to ensure the delivery of water to different users according to established, uh, established rules. These organizations are usually called water users organizations, water boards, or you know, water districts, um, etc. 
uh, and these can be public, these can be owned and managed by farmers or private operators. So, uh, in terms of the three thresholds that we have uh, selected for uh, this particular subjector, so this, that the water availability remains stable over the years for farm irrigating crops on more than 10% of its agricultural area. So if there is a farm which is using water for irrigation and it's, it's using water on more than 10% of its agriculture uh, area, but the water availability remains stable, okay, then this farm will be classified as, as green. Of course, it will, uh, default result will be for the farms that are uh, irrigating less than 10% of the, of the agriculture area. So all the farms which are either not irrigating or irrigating less than 10% of the agriculture area will be classified as green. Uh, this is a bit counterintuitive, okay? Um, you, you may be thinking that FAO is, uh, is, um, is, uh, is basically uh, recommending not to use water for irrigation for the farm to be classified as green, but th this is not the case. The, 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 the issue is that we here are in, in the environmental dimension, primarily, we are analyzing the impact of the agriculture on the environment, okay? So we are, we are monitoring as to what extent agriculture is contributing negatively or positively to the environment. So if the, if the farm is not using any water, it's not contributing to the water problem in first place. And hence, you know, this farm will be classified as green. The farm will be classified as yellow if it uh, uses water to irrigate on at least 10% uh, of the agriculture area of the farm, but he doesn't know whether the water availability remains stable over the years or experience reduction on water availability over the years. But then even if he's experienced water reduction, there are the, the, the water users. And red, um, if the uh, holding use water on more than 10% of the agriculture area of the farm, they doesn't know whether water availability remains stable over the years or experience reduction on water availability over the years, but there are no organizations that effectively allocate waters amongst the users, then it will be classified as red. So in terms of uh, um, the tests, uh, results from Bangladesh uh, pilots. Holding one, they reply to our question. Uh, we asked them as to whether they experience any reduction in water availability. They said, no. Water is always available in sufficient quantity, which was very good. Um, we didn't even go to the second question, okay, because uh, according to this folder, water, whenever he needs, water is available in, in that sufficient quantity. The total area irrigated is 89.7% uh, and hence this uh, holding is classified as, as green. Um, the second holding, they replied, yes, we are experiencing reduction in water availability. Uh, in fact, water level in my wells is progressively going down. Then we asked the follow-up question as to whether there are organizations that are dealing with water allocation. And they say, yes, there are organization and they are working well. This holding was, though was um, uh, irrigating 71.4% of its agricultural land area was classified as acceptable. Um, and the third, uh, we asked, uh, you know, the, the answer was yes, there is, I experienced reduction in water availability, water level in my wells is progressively going down. And they answered no to the follow-up question, which was no, there are no, organization dealing with water allocation. This holding was uh, irrigating 74% of the agriculture area with water and hence we classified it as unsustainable. And, and the last step obviously it's, uh, is the same like in case of the other sub indicators that I've been explaining. So we aggregate the areas classified as green yellows and red and divided by nationally representative area to estimate uh, the proportion uh, 
desirable, acceptable, and unsustainable. Any questions? So management of fertilizer is the sixth sub-indicator in the context of uh, 241. Sustainable agriculture implies that the level of chemicals in the soil and water body remains within the acceptable, acceptable thresholds. The theme is fertilizer risk. The reference period is uh, last calendar year. Now, the this sub-indicator is constructed using data collected through a set of questions to, to, um, to basically assess as to whether they comply with the, the, the following list of eight management measures or, or practices in terms of their usage of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fertilizer. And when we, when we say fertilizer, we talk about um, synthetic mineral uh, fertilizers, but as well about uh, animal manure and slurry, okay? And then we assess as to um, their awareness about the environmental risks associated with the use of fertilizers and uh, their behavior in terms of the plant nutrients um, measurement. So I'm not gonna go to the, to the list, this, all these concepts, as to what we mean by uh, these different criteria is well explained, not only in the methodological note, but as well in the, in the enumerator manual. So all, uh, all these uh, criteria uh, have been well defined, uh, well defined there. But just to, just to go through maybe a couple. So one of the management measure is that the holding is following protocol as per extension services or retail outlet directions or or local regulations not exceeding the recommended doses in terms of application of fertilizer for certain crops. Um, then uh, use organic source of nutrients include manure or composting residues alone or in combination with synthetic or mineral fertilizers and so on. So um, basically these are the list of uh, eight measures that were recommended to us by the experts. Um, uh, so if depending on the extent to which an agricultural holding is complying with these eight measures, we assign the farm green, yellow, and red status. Let me let me go to the to the uh, sustainability criteria for so the farms and associated agriculture area are classified as green. Um, if the, if it is using fertilizer, but it is at least taking four specific measures to mitigate environmental risks, okay? So of these eight, if the farm is using fertilizer is, and is complying with any of the four out of the eight, then it will be cons considered as green. Again, it will be farm farms by default will be assigned green status if they are not using any fertilizer. Again, just to explain here, here FAO is not recommending not to use fertilizer. We still farm, want farms to use, you know, or recommend farms to use fertilizer. But if they use fertilizer, they should be adhering to or complying with these best practices. So if the farm is not using fertilizer, it's not contributing to the fertilizer pollution problem in first place. And hence the farm is classified as, as, uh, as green in terms of uh, its, um, its impact in terms uh, on, on the environment. The farm will be classified as yellow if it at least take at least two measures to mitigate the environmental risks, two or less than less than four and greater than two and the farm will be classified as red if it if it uses fertilizer and does not take any specific measure to mitigate the environmental risk so if the farm is not using still using fertilizer and not complying with any of the above it then it will be considered as as uh, as red or or unsustainable So again, some results from Bangladesh. So the first farm, they said, are you, and in fact, as you can see here, most of the farms are using fertilizer, which is okay. So, 
yes, we use fertilizer. Then we ask the follow-up question of the eight measures. Okay, how many are you complying with? And this farm answers that we comply with only two. Okay, so two measures are adopted, hence it is considered as acceptable. If you go here, the farmer uses fertilizer and take at least two measures. So it, it's considered as acceptable. The second holding, yes, I use fertilizer and they comply with none of the measures that are recommended. Hence, it is considered as non-sustainable. Okay. Um, another example of the desirable. You use fertilizer? No. We don't even ask the follow-up question because they are not using any fertilizer. So it's redundant to ask them any question uh, about uh, the practices uh, and, and their compliance with it. So, but you know, this farm is classified as, as green. And, and 39, yes, I use fertilizer and out of the eight, this farm adhere or comply with four of the measures and hence it is classified as green again. Again, the last step is the same. I mean, I'm not gonna go into that. We aggregate the agriculture area, assigned green, yellow and red statuses and divided by the nationally representative agriculture area collected through the same survey to calculate the proportions under green, yellow, and red. Any questions? No. We still uh, have five minutes. Uh, we, we can keep um, going for like 10, 15 minutes more. What do you prefer? I would finish the next sub indicator and then at least, I mean, uh, I'm not gonna rush things because uh, uh, let's cover the four sub indicators okay. uh, maybe tomorrow. Yes. So I will cover one more sub indicator on okay. pesticides and then we go to the, okay, you know, to the, to the rest tomorrow. Okay, perfect. So yeah. last the sub indicator. So the fourth sub indicator in the environmental dimension is management of pesticides. Uh, to contextualize, pesticides are important inputs in modern agriculture. But if it is not well managed, then it can cause harms to people's health and as well to the environment. So the proposed sub indicator is based on information on the use of pesticides on the farms, the types of pesticide use, and the types of measures taken to mitigate the associated risks related to people or environment health. So these managed management measures are uh, grouped in uh, or, or clubbed in two groups. One is health related measures related to human health. And the second one is environment related measures. And then, you know, we ask a set of questions about the health related measures and then environment related measures. And then again, likewise, in the case of fertilizer, we see to what extent the agriculture holding is complying with these set of measures or practicing these measures at the holding level, if they are using pesticides. So the first one is in terms of health, adherence to label direction for pesticide use, including use of protection equipment while applying pesticides. The second one is maintenance and cleansing of protection equipment after use. And the third one is safe disposal of, uh, of pesticide waste, that is cartons, bottles, bags, other, other equipment, etc. And in terms of environmental measures, adherence to label direction for pesticide application, again, adopt any of the above of the of of these good practices that is adjusted adjusting planting time applying crop spacing crop rotation mixed cropping or intercropping and then and then so on so based on the based on the adherence of the farm to these uh, these two set of uh, uh, practices recommended by by fao we classify the farms as green yellow and uh, and red now, mind you, again, all these concepts uh, as to what we mean by bio biological pest control or what, what is biopesticide, 
or what is posture rotation or what do we mean by by pests okay all these are explained in the support documents that we shared with you already but we will be happily sharing these with you uh, post the workshop uh, post this training so if you are uh, really interested in getting to know more about these concepts because this is really important so once the enumerator goes into the field once he is administering these questions when he is seeking the respondent answers he needs to explain you know um, um, all these in a very simple language for for the for the holder of the holding to understand as to what the question is about so all these uh, uh, different terminologies and uh, concepts and uh, measures are explained in the enumerator manual so uh, again in terms of uh, assigning sustainability statuses um, green are the farms that only use moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides which is world health organization class 2 and or class 3 and if the farm is using moderately and slightly hazardous pesticides it adheres to all three health related measures and at least four out of seven of the environment related measures okay so first question is do you use pesticides yes i do which type of pesticide do you use i use moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide okay then the follow up question is of these measures uh, which 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 ones do you comply to and then based on the answer we then assign green yellow and red stripe again um, in terms of pesticide usage it is we by default assign green status to the farms that are not using pesticides because they are not contributing to the pesticide pollution problem related to health or environment in first place so if there is there is a farm which is not using any pesticide well and good they are by default green okay um, the farm is classified as yellow or acceptable if it uses only moderately or uh, slightly hazardous pesticide who class two or three again the who classes are described at length and defined at length in the enumerator manual so uh, if someone is interested in getting to know more about what does it mean then um, of course uh, they can they can revert to that, uh, that so the farm is only using moderately or slightly hazardous pesticides and is taking at least two measures each from the health and environment related measures then it will be classified as as yellow and the farm will be classified as red if the farm use highly or extremely hazardous pesticide which is who class uh, i 1a or 1b or illegal pesticides okay so if the farm is using highly or extremely hazardous pesticide it's by default is red okay or it uses moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide without taking specific measure to mitigate the environmental or health risks associated with their use fewer than two from each category then the farm will be classified as as red so again the uh, example from uh, bangladesh pilots results holding one do you use pesticide yes i do the follow-up question is which type of pesticide do you use I use highly or extremely hazardous or even illegal pesticides and it complies with three environmental and two health related measures but um, that is even uh, this question shouldn't even be asked because you know this polling is using uh, one of the most uh, toxic and dangerous uh, pesticides uh, from health and environment perspective and hence we classify this holding as non-sustainable or red holding to yes we use pesticide uh, we use moderately and slightly hazardous pesticide then we ask a follow-up question two two uh, two from the health two from two from the health and two from the environment related measures hence this is classified as acceptable let's pick up the desirable uh, holding 12 yes 
I use pesticide. I use moderately or slightly hazardous pesticide. Four from the environment measures are adhered to, and three from the health measures are complied with, and hence this holding is classified as, as desirable. So, and then the last step is the same. We aggregate the areas assigned green, yellow, and red statuses. We divide by the national representative agriculture area to calculate uh, proportion under green, yellow, and red. And I will uh, stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have any questions. So we are quite on time because it's 3.35 uh, Rome time. I still leave a um, few seconds people that if they want to have some questions, if we want to raise some questions. So apparently not. That's not a problem. We will have anyway uh, all day tomorrow, not all day, uh, tomorrow session and uh, Thursday session in case uh, uh, you will have all the questions uh, you can raise in and tomorrow. Um, as you know, so we didn't finish the program for today, but uh, we will uh, um, resume from uh, where we uh, arrived today and we will continue uh, tomorrow. I think uh, uh, we can officially close because we don't have any questions. So uh, really thank all of you for having participated to this uh, first day of the virtual training on the SDG 241. Today actually has been a very concentrated day where we have seen so many concepts. And uh, I mean, we have started to, to talk about the fulcrum of the 241 methodology. Um, yes. I think uh, we can officially close uh, the day. I wish you a nice rest of your day for the countries where we still have uh, some hours and uh, a good evening for the others. And um, see you tomorrow, uh, same time. Bye bye to everybody. Bye. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Спасибо. Bye. 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 Bye.